key thing is that people want to hear you rather than me. But um, let me begin by, by welcoming everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. And welcome to the 2021 Holocaust Memorial Lecture. Um, I'm delighted that so many people have uh, registered uh, for this event and uh, have been able to join us this evening. Um, as I said to Richard earlier on, I think one of the very few good things to come out of the current situation is the ability to bring events like tonight's lecture uh, to both local and global audiences at the same time. And uh, we had uh, well over 600 registrations from Dublin to New Delhi, as I see in the comments. <coughs> Uh, and uh, from Cork to Cape Town. And I think this will, may well be one of our largest and certainly most global uh, events to date. The uh, Holocaust Memorial Lecture is organized annually by the Holocaust Education Trust Ireland, uh, this year in cooperation with the UCD School of History. Uh, the lecture has been a very important event in the academic calendar since 2006, and it was one of the many important initiatives started by the Trust over the years to enhance uh, Holocaust education in Ireland. Back then in 2006, it was initiated by uh, Lynn Jackson of the Holocaust Education Trust in collaboration uh, with my esteemed colleagues uh, from Trinity, Ellen Kramer and John Horn. And I'm delighted that uh, all three of them uh, are here and are joining us virtually this evening, which I think is a very nice touch of uh, continuity. Uh, since 2006, some of the most distinguished historians of Nazi Germany have delivered the annual lecture from Peter Longerich uh, to Christopher Browning, from Mary Fulbrook to Jan Gross and uh, many, uh, many more. Tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Sir Richard Evans, has delivered the annual lecture before, back in 2012, I think on the question of uh, how unique the Holocaust was, and I think uh, it is wonderful that he has agreed uh, to be the first historian to deliver it for the second time. Before I uh, briefly introduce our speaker, just uh, one or two items of housekeeping. Uh, many people in the audience will by now be uh, very familiar, of course, with the brave new world of Zoom, but others may not. Um, in today's format, a webinar, you can see me, and much more importantly, uh, our speaker, but we cannot see or hear you. So at the end of the lecture, there will be uh, some time left for questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to type it into the Q&A section, which you find at the bottom right of your uh, Zoom window. So you don't have to wait until the end of the lecture. You can start typing straight away. I will collect the questions and then uh, put them to our uh, speaker at the end of it. Tonight's speaker will, of course, be uh, known to many of you. Sir Richard is uh, Regis Professor Emeritus at Cambridge University and a former uh, president of Wolfson College. He's one of the world's <coughs> authorities on the history of Nazi Germany and has been knighted for his services to scholarship. Uh, Professor Evans is the author of several critically acclaimed books, including a trilogy on the history of the Third Reich published around the world. And he has also authored numerous award-winning uh, books on other aspects of German and European history, uh, notably his history on the cholera epidemic, which I, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, picked up uh, again and uh, had another good look at uh, quite recently, but also the history of the death penalty. Uh, in 2000, he acted as principal expert witness in the David Irving trial, which also became a, a blockbuster movie, uh, Denial, uh, with the late John Sessions playing Richard in that film. Most recently, uh, Professor Evans has been busy writing uh, the very well-received biography of fellow historian Eric Hobsbawm and a new book on conspiracy theories, which arose, uh, I gather, from a larger Leverhulme Trust-funded project at Cambridge, and which has recently been published under the title The Hitler Conspiracies, which I warmly recommend to you. <laughs> Um, this latest book is unfortunately very topical, and some of you may have read his uh, op-ed in the Irish Times today uh, about the historical roots of modern-day conspiracy theories, or listened uh, to his interview on the same subject earlier on uh, at the Pat Kenny show. Today's lecture, uh, I believe, will draw 
on that book, which discusses some of the most prominent Nazi conspiracy theories. Um, and Richard, we're delighted to have you again as our speaker. I hope uh, that the next time you come to Dublin, we'll be able to do it in person and that we can afford some Irish hospitality to you uh, again after the lecture. So with that, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Robert. Thank you for the kind invitation and also to University College Dublin and the Holocaust Education Trust uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor and I'm only too sorry that I can't be there with you in person, but here I am uh, virtually, so I hope that's some kind of adequate substitute. Uh, I'm going to talk about conspiracy theories and particularly those involving Nazism and particularly anti-Semitic conspiracy theories because conspiracy theories are more popular, more widespread in the 21st century than they've ever been. They're powered by the rise of the internet and social media, enabled by the declining influence of traditional gatekeepers of opinion, uh, such as uh, um, uh, newspaper editors, uh, magazine editors, TV executives, book publishers, and encouraged by the spread of uncertainty, uh, the uncertainty about truth and falsehood, encapsulated in a perverse concept of alternative facts, popularized, among others, by former US President Donald Trump and his spokespeople. Now, over the centuries, Conspiracy theories have pointed the finger at many different groups, from the Jesuits to the Freemasons, but it's above all Jews who have been the object of the paranoia they represent. A minority religious community in an overwhelmingly Christian Europe, the Jews in the Middle Ages were blamed, uh, and also after the Middle Ages, but particularly in the medieval period, for a whole range of seemingly inexplicable events. Most notably, perhaps the Black Death, a pandemic of bubonic plague that killed half of Europe's population in 1348-9, and the French Revolution, which overthrew the traditional European order in the years after 1789. Massacres and bombs were the result. It was in Russia, under Tsar Nicholas II, that the most notorious of anti-Semitic tracts originated, known as the Protocol of the Elders of Zion, it purported to be the minutes of a secret meeting of Jewish wise men held in 1897 to plot the overthrow of civilization. 1897, because there was a Zionist Congress at that point, uh, which was used as the basis for this um, uh, extraordinary conspiracy theory, because it had nothing to do with it in reality. The book or booklet has been described by many historians as a document of immense power. As Norman Cohn claimed in his classic study of the protocols called a warrant for genocide, it took possession of Hitler's mind, it became the ideology of his most fanatical followers at home and abroad, and so helped to prepare the way for the near extermination of European Jews. The social psychologist, Jovan Byford, in his study of conspiracy theories, has called it the cornerstone of Nazi propaganda. The protocols have been considered such a, a significant document that the writer Umberto Eco devoted his novel, The Prague Cemetery, to a fictionalized account of their origin and composition. The penultimate chapter is entitled, The Final Solution, echoing the Nazi euphemism of the final solution of the Jewish problem in Europe for the murder of six million Jews during World War II. And there are many, many such testimonies. The protocols have been translated into many different languages, reprinted many times, and sold in millions of copies across the globe. And yet, if you read the protocols of the Elders of Zion, they turn out to be a very strange document indeed. It actually bears the heading from the reports of the wise men of Zion uh, on the meetings held at the First Zionist Congress in Basel in 1897. Protocols basically just means minutes. Congress was a real event, but uh, it also provided in the document's view the occasion for some secret meetings behind the scenes. But Zionism at this early stage of its history was a tiny movement, barely known even in Jewish circles. Its aim was to encourage Jews to resettle in Palestine at that time in the Ottoman Empire. But the Zionist Congress could be made to appear like a general assembly of the world Jewish community insofar as there actually was one, and of course there was not. The minutes record 24 sessions in all, summarized in a series of very short paragraphs. Everywhere the 
statement begins, the evil outnumber the good. Remember, this purports to be coming from the Jewish elders themselves. Force and money rule the world. We, that is the Jews, control the world's money. And so we control the world. Might is right and rule over the blind masses can only be exercised without moral restraint. We will destroy the privileges of the nobility and replace them with the rule uh, of our own bankers and intellectuals. Our control over the press will enable us to undermine the beliefs that ensure social stability. Indeed, we have already succeeded in propagating the pernicious doctrines of Marx, Darwin, and Nietzsche. In a similar manner, our newspapers and pamphlets divide society by sowing discord, undermining confidence in the government, by enrolling the masses in subversive movements like anarchism, communism, and socialism. And at the same time, by fomenting a damaging economic struggle of all against all in the free market, <clears throat> we are leading the Gentiles' attention away from the real masters of the economy, namely ourselves. We will exert our influence to destroy industry, it goes on, by creating our own monopolies, by encouraging overspending and unwise speculation, and by causing inflation. We'll create an arms race and bring about destructive wars. In the end, it says, the Gentiles will be impoverished and ripe for takeover. Universal suffrage, it says, will bring the masses to power. Remember, it's very uncommon in Europe at that time. We, the Jews, control the masses. Once we've attained power, we will censor the press and publishers so strictly that there'll be no criticism possible. We won't allow any religion except Judaism. All non-Jewish Freemasons will be executed. This is a rather extreme uh, act of violence. Uh, and Jewish lodges will spread across the globe. And incidentally, uh, there's relatively little violence in the protocols and an um, enormous amount of material about Freemasons. The teaching of law, political science, uh, all humanistic disciplines will be removed from the universities. We shall remove humanity's memories, all the facts of history that we find uncomfortable, and only leave those that cast a particularly unfavorable light on the errors of non-Jewish governments. Education will concentrate on pra practical skills. Teachers will be forced to make propaganda for us. Lawyers won't be independent, uh, but will have to serve the interests of our state. Unemployment and alcoholism will vanish as industry is cut back and domestic production reinstated. So that, that in a brief summary is the message of the protocols. It's rambling, chaotic, unstructured. It's hardly an example of rabble rousing anti-Semitic rhetoric. <clears throat> Many of the traditional allegations of religious anti-Semitism are missing. For example, it doesn't say anything about the allegation that the Jews killed Christ or desecrated the communion host, the communion service, or poisoned wells, the central allegation of the 1348 to 9 uh, pogroms, uh, or the uh, absurd and pernicious blood libel, uh, which involved allegations of the murder of Christian boys by Jews for supposed ritual purposes. Nor can we find in the document modern racist anti-Semitic tropes like the supposed physical degeneracy and spiritual deformity of the Jews, their alleged lack of rootedness in any one country, or their imagined materialism and greed. Uh, of course, it purported to come from the Jews themselves, but one could find attempts in, if it was a racist document, uh, at the refutation of these ideas. As historian Stephen Bronner has noted, the document lacked the primitive biological and pseudo-scientific foundations so admired by more modern bigots like Adolf Hitler. <coughs> Excuse me. Now in its strange amalgam of often bizarre ideas and its numerous omissions, the document really represents neither traditional nor modern anti-Semitism. It's very much uh, its own a unique document. It comes rather obviously from the world of Russian ultra-conservatism before World War I, where modern industry, democratic politics, social mobility and free thought were viewed as products of a satanic Jewish plot. And it's an obvious forgery. The actual authorship of the protocols remains obscure, but a likely candidate <coughs> is the anti-Semitic agitator Pavel Khrushchevan, who organized a pogrom <coughs> in his native Bessarabia, in which 45 Jews had been massacred. In order to justify the pogrom after the event, Khrushchevan, it seems likely, hastily cobbled the document together from a document is already circulating called the Rabbi's Speech. It's a lengthy passage lifted from a mid-19th century 
gothic novel by the ultra-reactionary Prussian police spy and forger Hermann Goetzscher, and uh, melded together with it a satirical tract published in 1864 by a French writer, Maurice Joly, containing an attack on the regime of the Emperor Napoleon III in the form of an imaginary dialogue between Montesquieu, who speaks in favor of liberalism, and Machiavelli, who expounds many of the cynical justifications for dictatorship, censorship, and so on that can be found in the protocols. In 1905, a revised version was published by Sergei Nilos, a minor Russian landowner and former, former civil servant who blamed the Jews for the failure of his estate business. He was a religious rather than a racist anti-Semite. He was obsessed with visions of the coming apocalypse. And Nilos produced a wider, uh, procured a wider distribution of the document, improved the quality of the language, and added material bringing the protocols into relationship with the 1897 Basel Congress. <clears throat> After the war, the document was smuggled out of Russia and quickly translated into several other European languages, including German. The protocols were publicly exposed as a falsification by an Irishman, the journalist Philip Graves. Born in Cork, he was the grandson of the Anglican Bishop of Limerick and half-brother of the poet Robert Graves and served as the Istanbul correspondent of the London Times. In 1920, acting on information from a Russian exile fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution, Graves wrote a series of articles in the Times that printed passages from Jolie's satire side by side with identical passages from the protocols and de definitively established that the protocols were a fabrication. And yet the document's widely publicized exposure as a tissue of falsification didn't do much to discredit it in the eyes of anti-Semites. The contents of the document were perhaps less important than its claim to provide authentic evidence of the Jewish world conspiracy emanating from the Jewish community itself, thus confirming what anti-Semites already believed. Adolf Hitler, for example, was already a radical anti-Semite in 1919 before the publication of the protocols in German. Writing in his autobiographical tract, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, Hitler said that the protocols expose consciously what many Jews do unconsciously. It's worth remembering an interesting phrase. As the Nazi propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, wrote in his diary in 1943, reporting on a conversation he had with Hitler, one can't speak of a conspiracy of the Jewish race in any straightforward meaning of the term, says Goebbels. This conspiracy is more a characteristic of the race than a case of intellectual intentions. The Jews will always act, Goebbels said, as their Jewish instinct tells them. And it didn't matter, he went on, whether they were genuine or not, because they exposed a deeper truth about the Jewish racial character. And it was that racist belief, not the protocols as such, that powered the Holocaust. Now, the protocols did not invent the idea of a Jewish world conspiracy. It was around long before they were concocted. All they did was supposedly to confirm it. We're dealing here with what historians and investigators of conspiracy theories have called a systemic conspiracy theory in which a single conspiratorial society or secret group or race carries out a wide variety of activities with the aim of taking control of a country, a region, or even the entire world. Often, according to the theory, the conspiracy is hatched over a long period of time, even in some cases centuries, and spreads over a very wide geographical area, even in some cases virtually the entire globe, propagated and perpetuated by some kind of universal organization like the Illuminati, the Freemasons, Freemasons or the Communists, or in the most widespread and persistent version, the Jews. <clears throat> and this is very different from what our scholars have called the event conspiracy theory, in which a secret organized group, usually rather small, stands behind a single event like the assassination of US President John F. Kennedy or the first landing of humans on the moon. The conspiracies imagined in this case, the event conspiracy theories, are usually short term, plotted over just a few weeks or months, or at the most a couple of years. Now, the two types of conspiracy may, in the minds of some conspiracy theorists, be linked. That is, an event conspiracy may be thought of as one expression of a systemic conspiracy. 
but this isn't necessarily the case. What's really important <clears throat> is the fact that both types of conspiracy imagine a hidden hand behind historical and in many cases current events. It may look as if the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 was a political event led by Lenin and his uh, cohorts, but the conspiracy theorists know that essentially it was just another expression of the secret machinations of the Jews, even if there's no evidence for this theory. Conspiracy theories are often propagated by people who feel marginalized or excluded from the political world or from main, mainstream social discourse. They offer a way of so simplifying a world that is overloaded with information until it becomes almost impossible to understand. The world of the conspiracy theorist is divided into good and evil, a world in which nothing happens by chance. Everything happens because some people intend it to happen. Major events don't occur in this view because of some chance action by a random individual. Whoever benefits from an event must surely have caused it. Classic example is the burning down of the Reichstag, the German parliament on the 27th, 28th of February, 1933, at a moment when Hitler had been appointed head of the German government but hadn't yet achieved dictatorial power. The Nazis used the attack as an excuse to introduce draconian laws, effectively abolishing civil liberties and enabling them to arrest thousands of their opponents above all communists just before a general election on the 5th of March 1933 on the grounds that the arson had been part of a conspiracy hatched by the communists to seize power. Even with the effect of suppression of opposition campaigns, the Nazis could still only win a majority with the help of their conservative coalition partners. There was no evidence of a communist plot. Of course, the communist leaders, in fact, who were put on trial for the arson were acquitted for lack of evidence by a court that hadn't yet been completely Nazified. The culprit wasn't a communist, he wasn't even German. It was a young Dutchman, Marinus van der Lubbe, who was found at the scene of the fire with incendiary equipment. He tried to burn down other public buildings in Berlin as a protest against the German government's failure to tackle the country's huge unemployment problem. Struck it lucky when he broke into the Reichstag in the evening of the 27th. For their part, the communists staged a counter trial in which they found the Nazis themselves guilty of starting the fire. They benefited from it, so they must have intended it. Classic example of conspiracy theorizing. And ever since, right up to the present, left-wing writers have repeated this theory. When faced with a problem that there's no direct evidence to support it and a mass of evidence telling against it, they take refuge in other classic features of conspiracy theories, alleging that the evidence has been suppressed, key witnesses have been murdered, and so on. There are even publications that include documents that have clearly been forged to lend support to the theory. On its fringes, there have been allegations that van der Lubbe was hypnotized or drugged to explain why he never deviated from his confession that he alone had started the fire. The fact remains, however, that no firm evidence of a conspiracy by the Nazis has ever been found. Hitler and Hermann Goering's panicky reaction to the arson reported at the time by the uh, Daily Express reporter, Sefton Delmer, and Goebbels' surprise when he told the Reichstag was on fire, he thought it was a, uh, someone was fooling him, it was a joke. Uh, they're attested by numerous sources and they show they hadn't planned it. If they had, it's very unlikely they'd have picked one single person as their stooge and even less likely that the person in question would have been a non-German and non-communist. The right take fire shows you can have left-wing conspiracy theories as well as right-wing ones. On the other hand, perhaps the most widespread conspiracy theory about the Nazis in the 21st century spread in numerous press reports, books, pamphlets, and even a 24-part TV series on the History Channel. It's been the claim that Hitler did not shoot himself in the bunker underneath the Reich Chancellery on the 30th of April, 1945, as the Red Army was closing in, but escaped to Argentina with his partner, Eva Brown, now Frau Hitler, and in some versions, Blondie the dog. <clears throat> now here again, the theory is based on a tissue of supposition and suggestion, and a complete lack of solid evidence. A photograph of Hitler at old age, turns out to be a photograph of a resident in an old people's home in England. The U-boat supposed to have taken him to Argentina turns out to have been sunk before the end of the war. An old woman remembered a secret visitor to a German house where she worked in Argentina uh, and, and had to leave meals uh, for him on a tray outside the bedroom door 
says he ate the same food as everyone else in the house, typical German meals, sausage, ham, and vegetables. The chauffeur of the house told her it was actually Hitler. But that seems rather unlikely, if for no other reason than the fact that the Nazi dictator was a confirmed vegetarian. Uh, no, Wiener Schnitzel, then just beans. So-called evidence of Hitler sightings in Argentina are all hearsay, secondhand, unconfirmed. And by contrast, there are no photographs or videos of Hitler dating from after the war, even though Eva Brown was a professional photographer who took hundreds of them at their retreat in the Bavarian Alps before the end of the war. The likelihood of Hitler living out of quiet retirement was vanishingly small, especially when we, when we know that other Nazi exiles in Argentina, who incidentally never mentioned or even hinted that he might be there, like Adolf Eichmann, uh, one of the chief organizers of the Holocaust, spent much of their time discussing the possibility of a comeback. Admirers of Hitler as a world historical genius can't believe the real truth, supported by eyewitness accounts from members of his staff, as well as meticulous investigations by historians, that he shot himself in the bunker to avoid capture and trial. Surely he must have fooled the, the Allies and got away under their noses. These ideas display another feature of many conspiracy theories, that there is much about the supposed cover-up of the truth by or what the theorists call official history as anything else. As the investigative journalist Roger Clark's written, the myth of Hitler's survival has persuaded thousands, even though it's disseminated, even through its dissemination over a lengthy and well-produced TV series, uh, perhaps millions of people, uh, that it's right to dismiss reputable and scholarly historians as liars and deceivers, despite the scorn and derision poured on this conspiracy theory by people who really know what they're talking about. As Clark says, conspiracy theorists pollute the wells of knowledge, exploiting and patronizing the poorly educated and intensifying their ignorance. They encourage people, he goes on, to believe works of scholarship and drag down the reputations of legitimate historians. If we damage the credibility of properly researched books and films, he says, then we substitute myths for reality. If serious historians are wrong about Hitler's death, and he really did survive for years after 1945, then perhaps they're wrong about everything else, including the Holocaust. And it's disturbing, Clark notes, to see how many Hitler survivalists are also, also anti-Semitic and Holocaust deniers. Bogus history, he concludes, does harm. It offends war veterans and millions of victims of the Nazis. And yet, Despite the lack of evidence for Hitler's survival and the overwhelming weight of evidence for his suicide in 1945, the conspiracy theories continue to proliferate. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, in fact, have become more widespread since the rise of the internet and social media. Perhaps their most significant manifestation can be seen in the self-styled QAnon conspiracy theory which claims that a secret cabal of cannibalistic Democrats, liberals and Hollywood actors is kidnapping children and subjecting them to various forms of abuse, including the extraction of adrenaline from their bodies, an obvious rehash of the medieval blood libel I mentioned earlier. Behind this, some of them believe are the Rothschilds, Jewish international bankers aided and abetted by the Hungarian American international financier, George Soros, who is also Jewish. Such beliefs have real consequences. QAnon followers were prominent, for example, in the mob that stormed the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on the 6th of January this year. Anti-Semitism emerged at a violent Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, as part of the Great Replacement Theory, a belief according to which the white race in America is being driven out by racial minorities. And the demonstrators indeed also charged, uh, chanted, Jews will not replace us. Since the election of Joe Biden as US president, the QAnon conspiracy theory has undergone a sharp decline since it was one of its central assertions and beliefs that Donald Trump would move against the supposed child trafficking conspiracy as soon as he was re-elected. Indeed, as absolute outer lunatic fringes, some uh, followers of the QAnon cult uh, believe that Joe Biden is not really in the White House, he's in a Hollywood studio, Donald Trump is there, and 
although it's not shown on the media, is executing uh, Democrats on the White House lawn. But the QAnon conspiracy theory is now merged with another conspiracy theory, at least in part, namely the belief that COVID-19 is a hoax and the vaccines against it are a product of a malign conspiracy. Anti-Semitism is a key component in anti-vaccine groups. A study of 27 of them found anti-Semitic conspiracy theories in the literature pumped out by 79%, from paranoid fantasies of a Jewish plot to destroy the economy by spreading the virus, to using the vaccine to destroy the fertility of the so-called white race by altering its DNA. The most extreme anti-vaccination conspiracy theories allege that Bill Gates is using the vaccine to inject microchips into people which will then be activated by 5G masks to turn them into zombies. And I have to say, I had my first jab a couple of weeks ago and I'm still waiting. Now, none of this is really necessary to say is true, but none of it's actually harmless either. Quite apart from encouraging people who believe in such ideas not to be vaccinated, making them a danger to others as well as themselves, it also stokes racial prejudice against Jews, leading to many kinds of discrimination, hate speech, and acts of violence even. Once one conspiracy theory makes its way into the social and political mainstream, others will follow. In the USA, <clears throat> a majority of Republican voters still believe that Donald Trump lost the presidential election as a result of a conspiracy by Democrats to falsify the figures with the aid of the manufacturers and distributors of voting machines who are now uh, suing for defamation and loss of earnings uh, to the tune of $2.7 billion. The Republicans are doing little to discipline or control their representatives in Congress who peddle anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, such as notoriously Marjorie Taylor Greene, a representative from Georgia, who suggested that the deadly bushfires in California were caused by what she calls space solar generators funded by George Soros and the Rothschilds. <clears throat> Anti-Semitism is a form of racism, of course, but it's essentially different from the kind of prejudice that regards other races as an inferior form of humanity. Driven at least in part in 21st century America by the evangelical religious right, it's essentially bound up with a conspiracy theory articulated in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and earlier documents that claims that the all-powerful Jews are working to undermine civilization everywhere. This is the belief that drove on the Holocaust and it's more necessary than ever, I think, to try and counter it. Presenting the evidence, debunking this and other kinds uh, of conspiracy theories, standing up for real evidence in the face of attempts to deny it are all badly needed interventions, but by themselves, they're not enough, particularly since no amount of evidence will convince many conspiracy theorists that they're wrong. Indeed, like Hitler or Goebbels, many of them respond by alleging that people who present the evidence are themselves part of the conspiracy. Uh, so social media companies are beginning to confront the spread of anti-Semitic and other expressions of hatred and misinformation. The removal of Donald Trump from Twitter is an important step. Fact checking, the flagging of misinformation have begun but need to be strengthened. The outlawing of anonymity on social media is in my view desirable, but there's a long way to go. Free speech necessarily has its limits. Currently, however, we seem uncertain about where those limits lie. We need to decide, I think, before it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, for this uh, wonderful and timely uh, lecture, which has already, I think, triggered uh, quite a lot of responses and questions here. Um, maybe let me begin uh, by uh, trying to group together two questions which struck me as particularly important. Um, as you were talking about the protocols of the elders of Zion, in some ways, uh, the mother of uh, modern 20th century conspiracy theories. Um, can you explain what the continuing appeal is of 
conspiracy theories beyond the aspect of uh, complexity reduction? Um, and how do academics make sure that their findings, their fact-based findings are communicated uh, to wider audiences who might subscribe to conspiracy theories? Well, the appeal of conspiracy theories, it has a number of different, they have a number of different appeals, uh, but a, a major one I think is, as I said, uh, presenting simple answers to complex problems. Uh, beyond that, I think they can convince those who peddle them or believe in them that they uh, are the real, uh, the real experts. The experts like historians and uh, academics and so on are quote unquote official. Uh, they're providing some kind of official knowledge uh, and uh, the real truth is known by only by the conspiracy theorists. And that, I think, explains the persistence of some of the conspiracy theorists. If you want to explain uh, uh, the, like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, uh, a lot of modern developments that the ultra-conservative compilers of the document dislike, uh, it's, uh, it's an easy way to do it by linking them all, all together, an enormously complex set of developments. Uh, so, for example, to take perhaps one of the most absurd bits of the Protocols, they were written at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, when all over Europe, uh, cities were building underground railways, uh, started by in, in London and then Budapest and so on. Uh, according to the protocols, uh, this is because the Jews are uh, cons in conspiring to have these underground tunnels built where they will plant explosives and they will blow up, uh, blow up the cities. Uh, there's an obsession with economic modernization pushed by Sergei Vita, the Russian economics minister at the time, who uh, uh, was in trying to industrialize Russia, something that the conservatives who were behind and who spread the protocols uh, were deeply up upset about. So uh, I think um, it offers these kind of paranoid uh, explanations. It offers a kind of uh, self-validation. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it, it can do that without necessarily being too, uh, too political or, or particularly dangerous except in the cases where uh, except in through the fact that it's spreading misinformation take the moon landings conspiracy theory it all happened in the a studio in hollywood for example um which is very easily disproven uh, so uh, I, I think those are the real reasons why why people rather like them and then of course um the spread of QAnon and similar conspiracy theories among republicans among the most uh, dedicated followers of Donald Trump, uh, encouraged by Trump, of course. Uh, that, I think, is an, uh, a kind of paranoid way of explaining uh, the fact that they lost the election uh, of the president to Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Richard. I have some <clears throat> questions actually coming, coming to the same kind of sort of position um, from India and Poland and Ukraine. Uh, asking about the, <laughs> your perception of the impact on the debate of states making uh, legislation or passing legislation about uh, history debates. So the history laws in Ukraine, for example, the very recent uh, Polish libel ruling uh, uh, and its impact on uh, Holocaust research uh, in Poland, <coughs> uh, but also <coughs> the impact, uh, say, in India, whether there is, you know, a, a distinction to be made between conspiracy theories on the one hand and alternative histories and multicultural societies of the present day. So it's a, it's a complex question, but... Um, it's a very different question or questions, um, which doesn't necessarily have anything at all to do with conspiracy theories. However, um, I do think this is a very dangerous trend in which governments are trying to uh, legislate against free discussion of uh, a nation's past. We've seen this in Poland, uh, where there are attempts to outlaw discussion of the involvement of Polish people in perpetrating the Holocaust. Uh, and there was such involvement. Uh, if you look at the historical record, it's absolutely clear, even though many Poles also rescued Jews from, from the, the Holocaust. If you look in, in, in Britain, you can see the Scottish devolved government is trying to rewrite Scottish history 
uh, in, in school textbooks and, and more generally to try and uh, emphasize its claim to independence and the historical roots. In uh, England, it's uh, a major topic of discussion at the moment. The government has just declared that it's not going to allow uh, research grants to be made to research the involvement of country houses uh, owned and run by the National Trust in the slave trade. Uh, it is trying to close down debate. Um, it, it, you can see this in, in Hungary, in many, many different countries. And I think it's an extremely worrying development which we historians have to try and counter. Mm -hmm. It's also happening in India. I should, I should also uh, stress that there's, there's evidence of this in India too. Yeah, there was actually a follow-up question on this, uh, how you assess the uh, current proposals for free speech legislation in the UK um, and the idea that, you know, people who are denied a platform at British universities should be... Well, the current Conservative government, I'm afraid, is trying to uh, distract attention from its own failures, particularly in combating uh, COVID-19, uh, which has resulted in Britain having one of the top uh, and at times the top uh, uh, death rates per million people uh, in the world. Uh, it's resulted in over 100,000 deaths, which is an absolute disgrace. And you can trace this back very, very clearly to the indecision of the government under Boris Johnson over uh, 2020. Um, and uh, uh, policies which have outsourced the provision of uh, equipment to private companies usually run by cronies of the of the current cabinet um, so uh, these these culture wars are, are really not that important um, but nevertheless uh, uh, you know the, the whole question of freedom of speech uh, okay in universities the government's now just decided to legislate to protect freedom of speech in universities a tiny tiny number of instances in which student unions have no platform, as I say, disinvited or refused to invite uh, people who they feel have extremely controversial uh, views. Uh, and this kind of thing is bound to happen. I don't think it's good. I think I believe in free speech. I believe in free speech in universities. Uh, students need to be exposed to a very wide range of opinions from right and left and opinions in particular, which they may find offensive. Free speech, is not free speech unless it includes the right to be offensive. Um, you would have stopped short, of course, of incitement to hatred or violence, uh, but it is important, but it's not something that should be legislated. Universities should be left to, to develop their own policies and, and enforce them. Something more historical, we're moving back in time. Um, one of the questions that was uh, put <coughs> up here was um, whether conspiracy theories require some element of truth and the example that was used here was for example uh, the famous association of uh, Jews with left-wing politics in the Tsarist Empire in the period of the of the Russian Revolution uh, where of course many many Jews saw this as a um, liberation ideology um, and whether this is kind of required for a myth to become successful Yes, um, I mean, propaganda doesn't usually, doesn't really have any traction unless, as your questioner said, it has some relation to the truth. Uh, but of course, what it does is distort it and manipulate it and exaggerate it. So if you look at the composition of the Bolsheviks and the Communist Party in, in, in Russia, uh, you can see that uh, there are a number of Jews in the leadership, but this is not nothing to do specifically with Jews, uh, a, a number of different subject nationalities were represented in the, in the party leadership because these nationalities were being persecuted by the Tsarist regime. Stalin as a Georgian, for example, there was a couple of others, or Johnny Kitsa and, and other figures who are also Georgians. Um, it does, uh, uh, if you look at the um, as well, the opposite conspiracy theory that Jewish bankers run the world. Well, you can see some Jews are bankers, and that has long historical roots because they were banned from uh, owning land and uh, carrying out artisan occupations and so on in Europe for many, many centuries and tended to concentrate in the cities uh, and engage, particularly because of Christian 
uh, beliefs and legislation about usury, about lending money, it kind of pushed Jews into the banking industry. But most bankers in Germany in the 1920s were not Jewish. Uh, uh, and so there's a, you know, uh, the idea that uh, Jewish, what are we called Jewish laser beams that were started fires in California uh, is entirely fantastic. But there were the fires in California. They actually did, did happen. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, th there are various sort of satellites you can kind of pinpoint in your fantasy about and, and allege that, uh, about the fires. So there's always some kind of relation uh, to, to what is actually, actually happening. But it's, it's a very um, distorted, exaggerated and manipulated kind of, exactly kind of, kind of relationship. I have a question here from a colleague, which I, uh, for some reason, think you'll enjoy, Richard. Um, some conspiracy theorists claim to have learned from studying critical theory and postmodernism that there is no truth. Um, and would you say that there is a connection between that? And as academics, how do we deal with that? Um, hmm. I, I got into terrible, terrible trouble when I put up a tweet a few years ago saying um, that the atmosphere in American universities, uh, postmodernist uh, theory has became a commonplace in the 90s and, and the 2000s, um, uh, that there's no truth, that there is my truth, there's your truth, there are many different truths. Uh, and so there were furious tweets by postmodernists saying things like, so Donald Trump has read Jack Derrida, has he, uh, etc. But it's more like a kind of general, general atmosphere. And of course, there can only be one truth about anything. Uh, there's truth and there's falsehood. And I do think that's had some effect on intellectual culture in the United States. But I, uh, I, that, because if you look at, obviously, um, uh, the people around Trump and, and officials and, and the people who peddled uh, the lies that he's uh, concocted, uh, you do find a substantial number of people there who have been to universities and have absorbed something of this, these beliefs. But I wouldn't want to stress it too much, uh, otherwise I'll provoke another Twitter storm, I suppose. Um, uh, you know, there are, there are wider reasons, I think. It's just a contributory factor. And uh, again, a more contemporary <clears throat> question. Um, so what is the conclusion you draw from all of this? Um, you mentioned earlier on kind of uh, removing Trump from Twitter uh, is a good start, but does censorship of disinformation, you know, lead to a situation where conspiracy theorists can say the state is censoring us? Um, mm. So this is kind of a circular discussion in some ways. Well, uh, I mean, I don't think governments should do this, um, but I do think, uh, that um, social media platforms, the companies that run them, I mean, these are profitable enterprises, the private companies, uh, have a responsibility. Uh, and they've been very unwilling to take it on because that gives them editorial responsibility, which means they can be sued um, for libel, defamation, uh, and so on. Uh, they've taken the step uh, of um, uh, uh, flagging up disinformation, and that happened in the last <clears throat> few months of Donald Trump's tweets, for example, <clears throat> much to his annoyance. They have taken down uh, and barred a, a lot of people who purvey disinformation. And I think that's an important step as well. Uh, I think they do need to go further. But of course, you end up with a point where, well, what, how do you define disinformation? Some disinformation is absolutely clear and not difficult to point up. Uh, but when you get to the point where uh, you're dealing with uh, legitimate dis uh, disagreements, for example, other points of view, then it becomes tricky. And I think we have to have a debate about this. We have to think much more carefully about, uh, about the issue of censorship versus the issue of harmful speech and harmful uh, social, social media posts. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you've ever written for an American magazine um, or an American quality newspaper, uh, and I do this from time to time, uh, you get um, visited by, once, once they've accepted your article in principle, by a fact checker. And I imagine these people as kind of legions of fresh graduates, absolutely keen to pinpoint every tiny mistake that you've, you've made. So you get kind of pages of emails uh, querying and questioning what you said. And it's unbelievably irritating. 
but I do think it's a, it's a useful service. Um, and, and I think that kind of thing needs to be done more. Of course, um, social media uh, are, are operate on a vast scale with, with hundreds of thousands and millions of people involved. But I think we need to do something. And as I said, we should think perhaps about making, <clears throat> making it uh, compulsory <clears throat> for people who put up posts and tweets and so on, actually not to hide behind pseudonyms, but to take responsibility for what they actually do. The, the, the project I ran in, in, in Cambridge on conspiracy theories, we looked um, at uh, social, social uh, at posts, discussion, uh, what do you call them, discussion threads, comments, comment threads uh, in uh, America on the Huffington Post, I think it was. And there came a point, I mean, millions of them. We had a, uh, an internet engineer who did big data analysis uh, and, and uh, I think like millions and millions of these posts. Uh, and uh, there came a point where the Huffington Post required people to identify themselves, give evidence that there was a real, there were real people, partly because of the problem of artificially generated comments and so on. And uh, what we found was the occurrence of the word idiot declined dramatically after that. So you, you, you can do these things, it, it is complicated, but we need to engage with this, these problems very seriously indeed. And I think that is just beginning. More polite forms clearly are required. Um, <laughs> I have loads of questions here actually in the, in the chat. Uh, again, I'm sorry that I can't ask all of them, but um, let me pick up this one here, which is again asked uh, by a, a colleague about the simultaneous uh, rise of conspiracy theories, but also actual conspiracies, particularly against empire, whether this is kind of a, a coincidence that, you know, you have anti-imperial groups like the Fenians and the Gada movement and um, emerging at the same time as conspiracies proliferating. Is there a kind of, again, a blurring of fact and fiction um, in terms of the, the timing of the emergence of conspiracy theories? Or is it random? Well, I, I mean, I think what I've said, uh, would I wish to imply uh, would, uh, that uh, uh, there are no conspiracies. Of course there have been conspiracies. That is to say, groups of two or more people uh, engaging in some clandestine or illegal or malign activity with a specific purpose in mind. And that's happened throughout, throughout history, uh, whether it's a coup d'etat or a revolution or whatever it might, might, might be, you find instances of this. There's a particular, <coughs> um, <coughs> as you said, Fenians and other clandestine uh, movements in the late 19th, 30th, 20th century, the anarchist movement, which resulted in many violent outrages plotted from behind the scenes um, uh, 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 around that, time. For example, a small group of anarchists, anarchists plotted to blow up uh, Bismarck, the Kaiser, and the entire uh, German government when they were going to open the Germania monument above the, above the Rhine uh, by laying fuses and bombs underneath the path they were going to walk on. And they only failed because the anarchists were too poor to buy uh, properly insulated fuses and it rained the night before and they were all damp and nothing happened. So, uh, I mean, there are many, many instances like that. There's even a, a short novel, a satirical novel by G.K. Chesterton, The Man Who Is Thursday, which I can recommend if you want an easy, easy, amusing read, uh, in which is a conspiratorial group of anarchists, which consists entirely of policemen uh, working uh, undercover. Uh, so uh, in the Bolshevik movement before World War I, the treasurer, Maninovsky, I think he was called, was actually a czarist agent. So there is this kind of murky underworld of conspiracies that which he really did, uh, really did exist. And there are moments in history when, when that, that is particularly, that, that, that kind of phenomenon occurs. I think what we're dealing with currently is a different, uh, different kind of thing. It's a proliferation of theories, which are entirely groundless theories. Uh, I don't think we have more conspiracies going on now than used to be the case. Richard, since you worked on it, and there, there were a couple of questions about the, um, the Reichstag fire. Uh, so in your book, of course, you're discussing this um, in detail, but just to um, remind people who haven't actually read the book yet, 
um, why did van der Lubbe set fire to the Reichstag building? He was <coughs> a, a, a young man who um, had been what's called an anarcho-syndicalist. That is to say, he, <coughs> he was an extreme left winger who believed that ultimately trade unions were the, were the, uh, the way of creating a revolution and, and, and bringing about a communist society. And he was bitterly disappointed uh, by the German trade unions and, and uh, conceived an immense uh, hatred of the German government. He was wandering sort of across Germany. Um, and this is in 1933, beginning of 1933, the, the biggest, the deepest, the most terrible economic crisis of modern times. Over 35% unemployed in, in, in Germany. And it was a protest against the government's failure, as he saw it, to deal with the unemployment crisis in Germany. Uh, that he started trying to set fire to public buildings like a, an, an employment agency or uh, I think it was the town hall in Berlin and he failed but with the Reichstag fire he got in through a window he was seen doing so by witnesses uh, at about nine o'clock in the evening on the 27th uh, with his um, fire making fire raising equipment and struck it lucky he managed to ignite the curtains and then the, the, the dome created an updraft and the whole thing went up in flames. So that's really his motivation. He was incidentally executed, found guilty. I mean, the evidence against him was overwhelming, but uh, it, it, of course, arson was not punishable by death and the Nazis uh, legislated retroactively to make it punishable by death. And that's of course a violation of the fundamental legal principle that there should be no, uh, no, 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 no punishment unless the law has said that is the punishment. It's kind of retroactive uh, pseudo justice. Okay, I have lots more questions, but I think I'll give you two more before I let you go to your pancakes because I think you have a <laughs> pressing, pressing engagement. It's pancake day today, yes. <laughs> um, but one of the uh, questions kind of revolved around um, the aspect of conspiracy theories and. Uh, what exactly historians uh, can do. I mean, obviously you're writing uh, books which reach a very uh, wide audience. Would you recommend uh, more public engagement in terms of, you know, radio, more uh, young historians should go out? Is there a message for uh, younger historians who are just finishing their PhDs in terms of their future engagements as citizens, you know, as, as public intellectuals, as well as scholars? Uh, I think if you feel you have the talent and you have the desire for it and you have the time to do it, uh, then it's, it's a good thing uh, to engage with the public. But uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of historians doing wonderful work who, who don't engage with the public, people producing editions of documents, for example, or working on subjects that are uh, don't have a, a public resonance, at least in, in the present. So I think it's up to historians themselves, particularly young ones, to decide at the beginning of their careers, to decide where to invest their time and their effort. Uh, you can work on some subjects which immediately get taken up uh, by the media, but most, most, most historians don't. And you certainly should not shape your work with an aim uh, of, of, of getting any kind of public, public resonance. I mean, I've been very lucky in a way because I, I've worked for scholarly reasons on, on, um, uh, on Nazi Germany. And that happens to be a topic that has uh, a, engages a very wide public interest. And that's brought me into all kinds of, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and I've been on a, a panel advising the UK government on claims for the restitution of artwork looted by the Nazis, for example. Uh, which has been a fascinating thing to do. And I've been dragged into public discussions and I wasn't very good when I started, uh, but you know, you gain experience and you have, you, you get ideas of how to do it. And I hope I've been, uh, you know, I have got better in it. And also I have the, have the time since I'm not overburdened with masses of teaching and administration and bureaucracy like my younger colleagues are. Lucky you. <laughs> uh, one final question, which is, I think, uh, an important one. Why, why do you think that the Jews from the protocols to Soros uh, feature so prominently time and again in these conspiracy theories? 
Well, as I said, there are other uh, groups um, and they are, uh, so uh, that you need to be, but that's kind of systemic conspiracy theory. You need to, to be spread across the world or at least operating in a number of different countries. And you can find that, for example, with the Freemasons, which they, incidentally is a, almost a bigger obsession of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion than, than the Jews are. It's, it's an amazingly prominent element in, in them. Uh, hence the protocol's threat to execute Freemasons who, who are, not, are not Jews. They're seen as a huge danger. That's because they are secret. The Freemasons are secret. They operate behind closed doors and they operate in a number of different countries. Uh, and again, it's the, it's, the, um, it's the inability of Christian society to understand Jewish religious practices or a feeling that they, they of course, spread across Europe and the world and they also uh, have a different religion and they operate in that sense behind closed doors to which Christians don't have uh, admission. Um, and then uh, it, there's a kind of uh, anti-elitism involved in a sense, um, because uh, there are, all the Jews, I mean, there are large numbers of extremely poor, downtrodden and persecuted Jews <clears throat> in Eastern Europe uh, in the first part of the 20th century. There are also prominent Jewish intellectuals, Jewish bankers and relatively Jewish lawyers, doctors and so on. Uh, and, and so there's a kind of identification of Jews as with clubs and societies like the Freemasons uh, as being some kind of uh, elite which arouses suspicion. There are a number of different, different reasons, I think. Richard, thank you so much. <clears throat> it's a terrific lecture and all the, uh, the wonderful comments are coming in, thanking you for your contribution. You would normally get a a big round of applause right now. Unfortunately, <laughs> we can't uh, do that right now. So on behalf of everyone else listening, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm clapping. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're uh, extremely busy. Uh, I hope we'll get to bring you over to Dublin in person uh, when all of this is over. And uh, it was lovely to no, see you. Lovely, uh, lovely to see you Thanks to everybody for listening, listening so attentively and thanks to all the questions. I'm just sorry I can't answer more of them. And finally, uh, if I may, do go and buy the book. <laughs> it's not very expensive. There it is. It's not very long. Uh, and I try to be uh, entertaining as well as informative in it. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks to the Holocaust Educational Trust and thank you, Robert, uh, for the invitation. Not at all. Thank you for being our speaker, our lecturer for the 2021 Holocaust uh, uh, Memorial Lecture. Thank you. And good night. Stay safe, everyone.